Hey, good morning, everyone. Good to see all your smiling faces today here at St. Chills Church. We're glad you're with us. If you're joining us online, uh, we want to say thanks for being a part of what God is doing in and through our church. I, you know, I had a really great week. <laughs> the Lord is doing some incredible things through our church. Oh my goodness gracious. I uh, was visiting a, friend's, uh, a friend of ours in the hospital this week over at Confluence. And as I was parking and going in, uh, a lady whom I did not know but goes to our church, uh, she stops me and she's like, Pastor Mike, as I'm walking in, she's like, Pastor Mike. And I'm like, what? And I, I turned and she like right before I got to the door and she goes, Pastor Mike, the body of Christ is waking up. And I was like, yeah, it is. <laughs> and, but here's what's so crazy about that. Uh, a few months ago, I had the chance to be in Phoenix, Arizona, and I was praying and I felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, it's time to wake up the body. And so she didn't know that. And it was just so incredible to hear how God is using our church through the ministry of Sage Hills to wake up the body of Christ across our valley. And listen, there have been moments in this journey that have felt like this might not work. <laughs> but I want you to know something, church. It's working. God's spirit is moving. People are coming to know Christ. People are being awakened to who they are in Jesus. And I just want to take a second to give God the praise for that. Would you join me just saying thank you, Lord? Yeah, come on. Well, last week we started this series called Released. We're talking about uh, this book of the Bible called Galatians. And we're, we spent some time talking about the Apostle Paul uh, last week. And we navigated Galatians chapter 1. And I'll just challenge you again that uh, this series is going to be uniquely uh, a series that we build upon each week. And so I don't have time to do a 30-minute summary of last week's sermon. And so I just want to encourage you to go home and watch. Watch Galatians chapter 1 if you missed it last week. Uh, Paul's letters build upon themselves. And this letter, Galatians chapter 2, you might feel a little bit lost, but I'll do my best that I possibly can to get you up to speed. But uh, last week we kind of concluded that you, you and me should put our preference on pleasing God, not people. We talked about how to fight off that idea of what it means to be a people pleaser and how the Lord, the fear of the Lord can replace the fear of people and it should replace the fear of people. Um, sort of towards the end of my message last week, I told you that Galatians was written to two different groups inside of the body of Christ. The, it, it really was written to three different groups, but the two that are most addressed inside of Galatians are this group called Judaizers, and the second group is this group called the Libertines. Both of these movements had major issues. The Judaizers, which are addressed from Galatians 1 all the way to Galatians 4, and the Libertines teens, which are dressed in Galatians 5 and Galatians 6. The, the Judaizers who we're going to be talking about today are the people, what they did was after they had received the gospel of Jesus, they reverted to life as if Jesus hadn't set them free. And last week we talked about it. We said, um, I told you, I asked you guys that question, has anyone ever been on a road trip before? And you, you found yourself looking at your siblings saying, why is dad in such a bad mood? Remember we talked about that last week? I hope you remember because it was a great story and a great illustration. But, uh, and what we realize, like the tone of Paul's letter makes him appear as though he's kind of in a bad mood. And, and in week one, we address why is the apostle Paul in such a bad mood? And we decided because they had so quickly reverted back to life as if Christ hadn't come to die. And what literally in infuriated the Apostle Paul was this idea that you could neglect the real, true gospel message. The neglecting of the true gospel that Christ died on a cross for your sins, resurrected from the grave, and it is by grace through faith that you are saved, not by work so that no one can boast. What Paul was doing was pushing a group against this group of Judaizers, telling them, do not put yourself in the center of the gospel. A self-centered gospel is no gospel at all. The only gospel is one that puts Jesus Christ at the center. Are you with me? So Paul passionately pleads with him, got to put Jesus back at the center of the gospel and his passionate plea to put Christ at the center of the gospel doesn't stop in Galatians chapter one. And I feel like preaching today. So would you stand to your feet out of reverence for reading God's word this morning? Remember, this sermon is entitled The Great Reversion, and Paul 
is passionately pleading to this church in Galatia, do not revert back to your old way of living. Uh, We're going to start at the conclusion of Galatians chapter 2, and you'll understand why in a second. Galatians chapter 2, verse 19. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for who? I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Thank you, Jesus. Would you just say, thank you, Jesus. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. I want us to read together Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. That begins with the word, I have been crucified. So Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Ready? Read. Yeah, you know, Paul here is making a very important plea to the church of Galatia. And I'm going to explain that plea to you after I read to you Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. This is another letter from Paul to a church, and this one's to the church in Colossia, verse 3, chapter 3. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. In God, let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you today for your word. Lord Jesus, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us today. Holy Spirit, this is your church. You are free to have your way in it. Jesus, speak to us today. Lord, powerfully through your word. Lord, let us don't get stuck in stale, broken, boring Christianity. Holy Spirit, wake up the body so that we can be the people of God you've called us to be. We, we, Lord, are so grateful to be part of a place that wants to be alive. And so we thank you together. And all God's children said together, hey, give someone a high five or a side hug or a handshake and tell them you're glad they're here. So when you read God's Word, one of the ways that you can learn to study God's Word even better is to try to identify what's called a canon verse. Everybody say canon. A canon verse. A canon verse is a verse in a chapter or a particular section of Scripture that the rest of Scripture can be read through, can be read through. And the canon verse for Ephesians chapter, or sorry, we're not even in the book of Ephesians, or for Galatians chapter 2, the canon verse is this verse that says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And you might be saying, well, what's the passionate plea there? The passionate plea to the church at Galatia and to the church in Wenatchee is this. You have been crucified with Christ. You no longer live, but Christ lives in you. The passionate plea is the cross of Jesus Christ was a game changer. Let me rewind. The cross of Jesus Christ was a game changer. Okay, yeah, thank you. Like, it changed everything. And for the church at Galatia, they took the cross of Jesus Christ as one of the things that happens that makes us right with God. And Paul says, it's not one of the things that makes us right with God. It is the thing that makes us right with God. It places him at the center of the gospel where he belongs. And Paul is saying over and over and over again, the cross of Jesus Christ was enough. The cross of Jesus Christ was enough. You don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to observe the law. You don't have to observe this. It's not about Moses. It's about Jesus. He's telling them over and over again, stop reverting. But church, do you know something? There's a great reversion. There's a great reversion. There is this gravitational pull on those of us who have put their faith in Jesus that wants to get us to revert back to who we were before the cross of Jesus Christ became our reality. And Paul is battling passionately against the church to remind them, don't revert back to religion. Paul makes an interesting statement. He says, I have been crucified 
with Christ. Has anybody ever read the story of the crucifixion? Just curious. Raise your hand if you've ever read it, okay? Or have you, have you ever heard the story of the crucifixion, right? You ever been to church on Easter? Are you breathing right now? No. <laughs> right, so I've studied it a, a bunch, obviously. I've read that story a couple times. I've been in church a couple times to hear that story. You know what I've never heard in the story of Easter? I've never heard Paul's name even mentioned. So my, my question to you is, did Paul actually get crucified with Christ? The answer is no. He was not one of the three people on the hill that day on Golgotha. Paul is not saying he was actually physically nailed. You guys know that, right? Like Paul was not nailed on the cross with Jesus. Jesus was very much by himself on that cross. There was nobody else nailed with him. But Paul said, what happened to Jesus happened to me. He's making a much bigger statement than actually being physically crucified with Christ. He's making a statement to those of us who have responded to the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. And the statement that he's making is a game changer. He's saying, what's true of Jesus is true of me. Beloved of God, Paul is saying, what is true of Christ is true of me. When Christ died, I died. When Christ rose, I rose. When Christ walks in hope, I walk in hope because he is my hope. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. And what that meant for this church in Galatia was that was arguing in this embroiled argument over circumcision and remembering the Sabbath and ceremonial unclean foods. He's saying, stop it. The price has already been paid. He said, it's no longer about a physical circumcision. It's no longer about an outward appearance. It's about an inward commitment to Jesus. It's no longer circumcising the body. It's circumcision of the heart that happened when you got crucified with Jesus. And Paul's saying, stop living as though that's not even that big of a deal. Stop adding it to your list of the law and understand that through Jesus, you are the righteousness of God. You stand righteous, right, before God the Father because of the Son and His death and resurrection. He made a statement. He said it very loud and clear. What's true of Jesus is true of me. And that's our opening declaration this morning. I want you to write that down. We're going to say it together. I want you to say it with me right now. Ready? What's true of Jesus is true of me. Let's say it again. What's true of Jesus is true of me. This week when you're in your car and your kids are driving you berserk and someone's driving slow because we live in Wenatchee and like, <laughs> you know, when you experience something this week and you're like, oh my gosh, you just find this reversion coming up, this, this, this pull towards the old self. You're going to remember, I've been crucified with Christ. What's true of Jesus is true of me. And Paul wasn't saying it just for himself. He was saying it for you. What's true of Jesus, the moment you step from death to life and put your faith in him, what's true of Jesus is true of me. So you're going to remember that this week. It's going to be incredible. And you're going to walk in the fullness of who God's called you to be. Amen? Amen. So that's our opening declaration. And our main idea today is the appeal that Paul made from Galatians chapter 2, verse 1, all the way till the end. And it was, appeal, it was an appeal to have the church at Galatia remain in Christ and resist the return to death. Remain in Christ and resist the power of death. Res resist the return to death. Write that down. Remain in Christ. Resist the return to death. And Galatians chapter 2 uh, tells us how you and I can do that, or at least how Paul instructs us how to do that. It's that remaining in Christ, right? That John 15, remain in my love that Christ calls us all to do. And not to be reverting back to an old lifestyle that will only ever lead to death. Remain in Christ, beloved of God. Galatians chapter 2, verse 1 is going to begin to tell us how. So we'll start with 1, verse five, or one through 5. Then after 14 years, this is the Apostle Paul. He says, then after 14 years, if you're curious about what the 14-year period he's instructing about, uh, 14 years prior to this moment that he's about to describe, he had been on a road, on a journey to go persecute the church. And while on that journey, he has an encounter with what we know as Jesus, but he had no clue at the time. And this encounter with Jesus completely and totally changes his life. And then after that time, he retreats 
to the desert and he literally gets discipled by Christ and some godly people and literally gets raised up in the faith. And then 14 years later, where we'll start right now, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I also took Titus along. I went in response to the revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed leaders. Everybody say esteemed as leaders. leaders. Not everybody said it. Say esteemed as leaders. I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure that I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to, to be circumcised, even though he was Greek. This matter arose when some false believers had infiltrated our rakes to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. That's a good word, Paul. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. The first thing that we learn is that Paul, 14 years after his conversion, he returns to Jerusalem. And when he gets to Jerusalem, he meets with these esteemed leaders. And we learn that Paul didn't go alone. He brought two people with him. One of them was Barnabas. Everybody say Barnabas. And the other guy was Titus. Now, Barnabas was a very well-respected Jew. I mean, he was respected. He was a leader in the church. He was part of those original group of apostles that, that were raised up in Jerusalem and sent out into the world. He was a respected person. So the very, the, by very nature of Barnabas being with Paul when he returned, there was credibility to Barnabas and Paul, be, to Paul because of Barnabas. The second person he brings along was Titus. And Titus is interesting. Titus was a leader of the church. Titus took the message of of Paul that he brought to the Gentiles. He got saved under Paul's ministry and then began to take his missionary or ministry to the world. And the Hebrew people that were in Jerusalem heard stories about this guy named Titus. He was a very well-respected man as well. However, he was not Jewish by, by ethnicity. He was Greek. He was a Gentile. So it was really interesting. Paul was going to be going to preach to these esteemed leaders of the church and tell them about this message of Jesus, right? And about how the message that he received from Jesus was that it's not only for Jews, it's also for Gentiles. Any Gentiles in the house? Hey. (laughs) You're like, I don't know if I'm a Gentile. Are you Jewish? No, then you're a Gentile. (laughs) Yeah. So anyways, so his message was for the Gentiles and the message for the Gentiles was that because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, there was no longer this, this, it was no longer just an ethnical club, (laughs) that all were invited to play, right? Galatians chapter three, verse 21. Now there's no longer male nor female, Jew nor Greek. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And that's the message that he preached to these guys just to make sure that they were okay with him winning people to the faith and not telling them to be circumcised. This was a big deal. So check this out. This group of apostles that were in Jerusalem, right? They had heard about Titus. And Titus is now with Paul, and Paul is telling them about this message to the Gentiles, saying that you don't have to be circumcised. And he brought with him a person who had followed Jesus, been effective for Jesus, and not circumcised. And Paul essentially said, if you think that everybody needs to be circumcised, go ahead and tell that to my buddy Titus. He's right here. It was kind of like Titus was the first sermon illustration for Paul. For Paul. He's like, point number one, check out Titus. And here's the deal. Titus had great fruitful ministry because he was crucified with Christ. He no longer lived, but Christ lived in him. But Paul does something that's even bigger here, church. He does something that's bigger here. His plea to these apostles was to remain in Christ and resist the return to death. And he told them in order to remain in Christ and resist the power of death, Paul gives us a window into one of the ways that we do that. He says that we would remain in Christ and resist the power or return to death when we do like he did. And you know what he did in this first chunk of Galatians chapter two? He submitted himself to spiritual authority. And I'll tell you what, do you guys know anything? Do you you guys know Paul's kind of a big deal? Would you agree with me on that? (laughs) I mean, it's a big deal, right? Like, I mean, he, he wrote a big chunk of the book that we read. He, he's kind of a big deal. Like, he was popular. He was, I mean, he was, I mean, in terms of Judaizers, he was the number one guy. 
right? Amongst the Pharisees, he was the number one guy. Everybody respected Paul. But now all of a sudden, it's not just Pharisees and Judaizers that are respecting Paul. Now the body of Christ is beginning to respect Paul because he got a revelation from God. This guy was popular. He was famous, well-known, feared, loved, respected. And what Paul did in Galatians chapter 2, verse 1, when he went to the apostles to try to bring credibility to his gospel is he showed us what you and I need to do in order to remain in Christ. And that is he submitted himself to spiritual authority. And church, can I just share with you That's a very difficult thing to do in our culture. It really is, right? Because on one side, there's this submitting to spiritual authority and allowing somebody through great humility on your own side to literally be a voice in your life to submit yourself to someone. But on the other side, there's a culture that exists that likes to pull with every ounce of its being to get you to remain isolated. And did you know that there are so many powers that are at work inside of us that are trying to get us isolated? I'm going to tell you right now, kind of jokingly, but kind of not, social media is the spawn of Satan. Yeah. Yeah. It is. And I'll just share with you. I, I remember the day. I remember the day when I realized social media was a problem for me. I was, uh, I was 23 years old. I was working at a church in Rancho Cucamonga, and I was, uh, I was talking to the pastor in a staff meeting. And the pastor said, has anybody connect with, connected with so-and-so? And I said, oh yeah, I just connected with him yesterday. He's like, really? Well, what did you guys talk about? And I was like, well, we talked about da 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 and we listed all this thing. And as I'm talking to him about this conversation I had with him, it dawned on me, I never talked to him. He messaged me. I saw his post on MySpace. It was how old it was. <laughs> I messaged him. He messaged me back. And we had this interaction, which I, in my own mind, and by the way, the plan of the enemy, re- took that as that was a real conversation. Can I share with you, a like on Facebook will never take the place of a real hug. It won't. We need each other. And in our need for each other, we have to submit ourselves to one another and to spiritual authority. It's the way the Lord designed it. And Paul did it. Big deal, Paul. He did it. He submitted himself. And you know, if you know Paul, this is kind of funny because he didn't even really agree with these guys. Even though he didn't agree with them, he submitted himself. He humbled himself. Can I share with you, humility is essential to healthy Christianity. It's essential. Paul's a big deal. But he said, look, I know how God has designed the church. And he's put these apostles as the leaders of the church. I need to submit myself to them. I remembered uh, when I was um, going through the process of becoming a free Methodist elder, like an elder in the free Methodist church, I had to go before this board. And this board is called the MEG board, the Ministerial Education and Guidance Committee. And, um, and where, where I, when I was going to this MEG board, it was my final step before ordination. There's all these different tracks you can choose. And I chose the college track. And I had crossed all of my things off the college track. I had taken my class. I have read the books. I had proven fruitfulness in ministry. And so I walked into this room at the Meg board. My head was so blown up. I was like, this is just a dot in the eye, crossing the T. My head was so huge. Like Cassie had to come with me to help hold it up. I mean, it was (laughs) massive. And if you know my wife, you know she wasn't holding up. She was pushing it down against the table. Uh, Anyway, so, oh. But I'm in this Meg board and they're asking me questions on theology and the word and practice. And of course, I got all the answers right because I knew the answers. And at the end, I was waiting for them to come forward and say, Mike, we've prayed, we've sought the Lord, and we are excited to tell you that you're going to be an elder. I was waiting for that. And I heard them when they came back. They said, Mike, we've prayed, we've thought, we've read your, your, your statements. Everything was true, but we've decided not to ordain you. And I was like, <laughs> I don't need your stupid ordination anyways. (laughs) And I was like, why? And they're like, Mike, we feel like you are taking the easy road. I'm like, well, you know me. That's what I do best. (laughs) And they said, Mike, why won't you go to seminary? 
And I said the most arrogant thing that I had ever said in my life, and I've chewed these words since then. I said, seminary is the equivalent of cemeteries. It's where pastors go to die. There's no fruit in it. And I just saw, and by the way, the president of the, the, the dean of the theological seminary at Azusa Pacific was in the room. He looked at me like, <laughs> Cassie and I left that room. We went home and she was not happy with me. <laughs> Big surprise. <laughs> And, and, and we talked on the way home, and I made some phone calls on the way home. She was driving, and I made some phone calls to other denominations to see if they might have place for me. I felt like, oh, you know what? This is perfect. I'm like Jesus. I'm like Jesus. Like, right? Because he wasn't accepted in his hometown, and neither am I. That's the problem. They're never going to respect me because I grew up here. I just went on this tyrant. I literally had my application at three different churches by the time I got home. I was so offended. But that night... The Lord, as he always does, pokes this little needle in my blown up head and began to deflate me. <laughs> and he asked me this question. Is the Meg board leaders in your life? Are they leaders in your life? I was like, yes. Then why not submit yourself to leadership and spiritual authority? And I was like, no, I'm not going to cemetery. I hate that place. And literally, over the next 48 hours, I prayed and fasted, and everyone who I respect in my life called me over this next 48 hours and said, hey, there's something going on in your life, and I want you to know something. I think you're supposed to do it. And I'm like, really? And so guess what? I drug my feet into the seminary, signed up, took the classes, and can I tell you something now? Seven, eight years later, they were right. I hate chewing crow. I hate it. There's a lot of things I love to chew. Crow is not one of them. I was wrong. And in that moment, I had the opportunity to respect and honor the people who were in leadership over my life, and I chose not to, and I paid the price. But now, on the other side of that, I want to share with you, seminary was one of the best things I ever did for my ministry. It made me a better pastor because it was something I did not want to do, and I did it, and it was terrible. Okay, so moving right along. <laughs> <laughs> So Paul, right, so you have an example of, of a time that I literally had to humble myself. If I wanted to continue in ministry, I had to humble myself. And we have the example of the Apostle Paul who had to humble himself. But you know, if you really want a great example of what humility looks like, you have to look no further than Jesus. Did you know that Jesus was equal with God? There's some weird theology out there about how like, well, yeah, but God, the Father's obviously greater and Jesus. No, 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 listen. The Father, Son, and Spirit are completely equal they don't, sh like, they share the throne and the title God. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. But the Bible says in the book of Philippians that Jesus did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped or held onto or for his own benefit. The Bible says he humbled himself. Guys, do you know how big of a deal it is that Jesus humbled himself? The image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, by him and for him all things were created. Jesus humbled himself. And we walk around, but yeah, but I'm a big deal. <laughs> like, listen, if you and I want to be people who cling to, the to, to Christ and, listen, battle off the returning to death, we are going to have to learn to return this way by submitting ourselves to spiritual authority, knowing that there's, there are people out there that God has appointed. It doesn't mean they're smarter. Doesn't mean they're more well qualified. Doesn't mean they're older. Doesn't mean they have more experience. What they have is God's call on their life. And I have people like that in my life that have been appointed by God as leaders in my life that I have to submit myself to regardless if I agree with them or not. I have to learn. Because when I don't, I begin this gravitational pull towards what's called rebeldom. <laughs> you guys know about rebeldom? Where I'm a rebel, where it's like, no, they didn't listen to what I said, so I just moved. Clearly, they didn't hear the Lord right. <laughs> because they're not doing it my way, they didn't hear Jesus. Beloved of God, can I just share something? It may be you who's not hearing Jesus. Submit yourself to spiritual authority. You will resist the return to death. Remove yourself from isolation. Be a part of the community of God and watch what the Lord wants to do. Amen? Amen. Let's keep on going. Uh, so point number one is return. Uh, remain in Christ. Resist the return to death by submitting to spiritual authority and resisting isolation. Galatians 2, 6 through 10. 
As for those who were held in high esteem, whether they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. That's another amen statement. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All that they ask is that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do. Uh, What's happening here, church, is very important, right? Paul is writing a letter to the church of Galatia about the gospel that he preaches. In order for the gospel that he preaches to receive the uh, credibility it is due, it had to be affirmed by the pillars of the faith, right? The Johns, I'm sorry, the James, the Peters, and the Johns. These people affirmed his gospel. And so now when Peter, or excuse me, when Paul went to this group of Judaizers and says, look at these pillars of the faith now affirm it. This was a turning point in Paul's ministry because his ministry has now been brought the credibility that is due because of the pillars. And we'll jump back in to verse 11 and wrap this thing up. When Cephas, everybody know who Cephas is by any chance? Who's Cephas? He's Peter, okay? Cephas is his Arabic, Aramaic name. Peter came to Antioch. I opposed him to his face. Woo! You guys know Peter, you guys know Peter, right? Remember when Jesus said, who do they say that I am? All the other disciples got it wrong. Peter said, you are Christ, the Messiah, right? And Jesus says, Peter, what what has been revealed to you was not by human hands. It was by the Lord, by the Spirit of God. He says, and you are the rock in which I build my church. He was the lead apostle. And Paul said, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Oh, no, he didn't. And here's why. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. They had a club. (laughs) If you want to know what your initiation in the club was. (laughs) Never mind. (laughs) Verse 13. The other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw them, they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. I said to Cephas in front of all of them, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law because by the works of the law no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. So we see here this battle between Peter and Paul. Here's what happens. Peter goes to visit Paul in the mission field, sees great fruit amongst the Gentiles. And Peter's drawn to it. He's like, man, Paul, you're doing a great work. The Bible says that they ate together, they drank together, and that they were happy and they were loving life together. But then James, the brother of Jesus, sends some disciples to check on Peter. And when James's brother, the disciple of Jesus, his, the, his disciples came who were very... Um, I don't know what you would call ritualistic Christians. They showed up. Peter immediately was like, oh, I wasn't hanging with those guys. He kind of reverted back. It was like, oh, you're one of those guys now, Peter? Right? You're one of those guys who hangs out with Gentiles. So, wow. Are you one of Paul's friends now? And Peter began to revert back to saying, well, you know, I just was doing that because, you know, I just, for a little bit, I'll be back to you guys in no time. So Peter began to pull back. And Paul says, look it, what you're doing is incorrect. Peter went so far that he was questioned by a group of Judaizers whether or not they had to be circumcised. Peter said they had to be circumcised. He flipped the gospel. And Paul says, you can flip a lot of things, but not the gospel. <laughs> 
not the gospel. I'm going to call you out on that. And he calls him out on that. And in calling them out on that, he passionately pleads to Peter, don't revert back to a life where Christ is not the center. And for you and me, it's a little different, right? I mean, none of us go home and bust out the Torah that's on scrolls, right? Anybody have a Torah scroll at home? Maybe you do. I, my kids haven't memorized the Torah yet. I've been trying. They just don't listen to anything. But for these guys, like the Torah, I mean, that, that was it for them, right? Like, but for us, it's a little bit different. Our reversion isn't to Judaic law. Our reversion, the thing that we can be very, very likely to fall into is leading a life that is less than God's best for us. Our reversion is we get saved, we get set free, we begin to live in the fullness of freedom, and then all of a sudden we get snared up in something. And that snared up into something, it begins to pull us backwards towards who we used to be. We begin to listen to lies like, oh, yeah, you're all Christian now, right? You can't do what you used to do. We begin to listen to lies about, yeah, you're not, that's not who you are. I know who you are. You, you used to do X, Y, and Z. And you begin to agree with these lies. And all of a sudden, you find yourself, right? You find yourself beginning to listen to the lies and all ensnared in this idea that I'm not actually good enough to lift my hands in worship. I'm not actually good enough to go to church on Sunday. I was such a heathen all week. I, I can't actually do that. I'm not, I did miss that. I do did that. And all of a sudden you find yourself ensnared in the law of sin and death. You are listening to the accuser, not the one who stands against the accuser. You're listening to the, the, the script of things that are going to be presented against your life on Judgment Day. You're listening to all of the sins and all of your bad relationships and bad choices, and you're beginning to allow those things to become identities. You begun, and then all of a sudden you begin to realize, oh, that's really who I am. You're listening to the accuser, not your advocate. Because your accuser says you're a sinner. Your advocate says you've been set free by my blood. And the more we listen to the accuser, we revert to life before Christ died and we pretend that all of a sudden we've got it all together, but we're working out this salvation thing in our own time. I'm just working out my own salvation. Stop it. You, like me, need a savior. We need an advocate who will stand in our defense, who allows us to be the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. So church... Don't return to death. Don't return to death. Resist it by submitting yourself to the law of grace. The grace that only comes from the cross of Jesus Christ. Submit yourself to the simple gospel and allow that simple gospel to permeate your heart and mind and push you into a life that is led by your advocate, not your accuser.